this computer. Cool. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started now. Um, welcome everyone to week nine of Figma Decal. This week's content is about illustration. This is like my favorite lecture. I am like personally very biased. I wrote this lecture. I really like it. Um, and it's also kind of one of the last remaining like heavy topics that we're going to be covering in the class um, for a little bit of context. Next week, we're actually not going to have lecture. We're instead going to have a class social um, if you were interested in that. So during the attendance form at the end of it, there's a question asking if you're interested in having a class social. Please answer honestly. Uh, if there's enough interest, we'll do something. Probably hang out together on the Glade um, just to get to know each other since we know that it's difficult to meet people. And so meeting everyone outside will be hopefully a little bit easier. Um, but yes, there's no, there's no lecture next week. And then week 11 is going to cover special topics and things like career. Um, and then week 12 is our final week. Uh, it's fast approaching. And that's when we'll be talking about um, the final presentations, which we're going to introduce today. So today we're going to, yep. Um, I can't access the slides. Yeah. So yeah, I don't really know why that's happening. Um, so for the slides, try adding dash backup at the end. It should bring you to the file itself um, where you should be able to view it, but not edit it. Okay. Let me know if that works. Um, but yeah, today we're going to be covering um, a little bit about the final. So we are going to be releasing the final today. The link is actually already live on the website. So if you go to bit.ly slash Figma decal, you can find final project on the website. Uh, and then we're going to be sharing a couple of examples of final projects from past students uh, tomorrow. Then we're going to be covering illustration basics, talking about how to improve your use of the pen tool, um, and then different kinds of fills and effects um, for the rest of the day. So these are today's, uh, oh shoot, the links aren't here. Um, these are the links for today. Um, the attendance form is bit.ly slash FD SV22 like nine. Um, the lecture file, we've been having some issues in Figma community today for some reason. So try this and if it doesn't work, um, you can add dash backup to the end. Does that work? It doesn't work either. Okay, let's see what we can do here. Okay, it should be that anyone with the link is able to view it. I'm going to send this into the chat. Let us know if this link's work. This link works in the Zoom. Um, Christy, could you send that link into the Slack and course announcements? Um, but yeah, is anybody on the Zoom able to access this link that I just sent? Okay, I see some people popping into the file. So um, please do not make edits to this file. I don't think you should be able to, but you can follow along with the slides here. Um, apologies for this. I, I'm gonna just contact Figma and see what's wrong with our file that they won't publish it, um, but feel free to check things out here. Um, all right, and if you're watching this um, online asynchronously, it should also be in the Slack channel itself in course announcements um, so that you're gonna be able to access it. I'll send it into general later too, if you're auditing the course. So we'll begin by talking about the final introduction and what your final is going to look like um, and how and why you're basically going to be deciding that for yourself. So the final is essentially to create your own proposal for what kind of project you want to do. Our goal for this project and for the class overall is for you to discover something that you're personally interested in making and see that vision all the way through into a completed product. So we want to avoid, like with the midterm, giving you really, really strict prompts and giving you really, really like, you know, specific hypothetical scenario like build an app for going to the airport and making sure that you're on time to everything and go through TSA really quickly um, or build an app for you know XYZ thing that maybe you're not personally interested in. We want to make sure that you're doing a project that you feel personally invested in um, because we know that you're going to end up having to spend a lot of time on this um, and we know that people take decals mostly for fun so we don't want to make it something that is extremely stressful on you. So the requirement for the project is to incorporate at least two of these quote unquote more advanced skills of Figma that we've discussed during the class, which are auto layout, variance, prototyping, and illustration, which we're discussing today. We spent the last couple of weeks talking about auto layout and prototyping, and we discussed variance earlier in the course as well. And we'd like to make sure that you uh, find proficiency in at least two of these skills in some way for the final. I want to reiterate like consistently throughout this class that to be good at using Figma or to be good at design, you do not have to be good at every single possible part of the tool, um, just things that you are interested in doing and things that you find will be helpful for you to leverage as um, part of your toolbox in the future. So these proposals that we've, um, oh, <laughs> this is wrong. This is due on Monday. So the proposals are actually going to be due Monday. You can submit earlier if you want to get it out of the way and we can ping your TA to ask if they can leave 
feedback on it a little bit earlier, but by default, um, proposals are due Monday. They have to include your project idea and a clear description of the project, the two selected skill concentrations that you're gonna cover, and then your goal for a midpoint check-in. There's going to be a midpoint check-in on Tuesday, April 11th. That is two weeks from now. This is because the week 11 lab is going to be um, a critique on your um, final project as it is at that point. We would like to just do this as a way to help everybody kind of time box where they are and make sure that you're not like cramming everything really late. I know that everyone ends up doing that anyway because this is a class at UC Berkeley, um, but the best that you can to kind of space out your work is always going to be helpful, um, especially because we hope that these can be something that you use as, say, like a portfolio project in the future um, or just something that you're able to really be proud of. So the goal is to have something that you are prepared to show um, two weeks from today at this midpoint check-in. This is also a way for us to leave feedback because all of your TAs will be giving you direct feedback on your work as it is so that you feel more prepared going into the weekend um, or going to the last couple of days before the finals actually do. Cool. Any questions about the proposals? Cool. Um, there's also plenty of other information on the um, on the actual final page on the website, which we'll share out um, later after lecture today as well. The actual submission itself is gonna be very similar to how you submitted the midterm. It's going to be a Figma file plus um, the write-up. There's also a quick form that we would like everyone to do. We really want to see as many people as possible present these at the final um, lecture. We know that not everybody might be comfortable doing so, so it's an opt-in rather than like a required thing that you opt out of. Um, but we really, really encourage you to um, share everything that you do, even if you're kind of at the last few days and you feel like you haven't really done every single thing that you originally proposed. You don't have to know that. The two other people in the class just want to be able to see what you've been working on, especially because we know that it's been difficult to kind of see everyone's work throughout the course of the semester. Um, so yes, please think about whether or not you'd be comfortable sharing your work. You can do this remotely or in person. We ran it hybrid last semester and it worked fine. Um, but the submission will require the form, uh, the file, and the write-up itself. The write-up is very similar to the midterm write-up, 300 words maximum, submitted as a PDF that describes your proposal, which we already will know a little bit about, so just briefly going over it again. And then most importantly, your design process and a little bit about your final product. The entire project is due Monday, April 25th. Uh, at the end of the night, which is the day before lecture 12. If you have any extension requests or accommodations, just talk with your TA and we'll figure out a more appropriate deadline. We don't have to get grades in until I think after finals, so we have quite a bit of flexibility there, um, but just let us know early on so that we can know um, how many finals we'll be grading um, at what times. Any other questions about the final exam? Um, and just to clarify, the proposals are due this coming Monday. If you submit earlier, you can back earlier. Um, but otherwise, just submit them by Monday. Cool. All right, we're going to go into the rest of the content for today, starting with an illustration gallery. I'm going to start talking a little bit faster because there's a lot to get through. Um, but this is my pitch for everybody to stop using Adobe Illustrator. So we're going to be start looking at a couple of different community files that are like currently available that you can take a look at. Um, all of them are linked. So if you're on the files, you can go ahead and click on the links to open them up. Um, but the first one is these vector illustrations by Spencer Camp. I think these like visually might look a little bit more simple, and I think that they're a little bit more approachable in understanding how exactly somebody were to make this in Figma. So if you look at this middle one, for example, you can see that it's essentially just arcs. Um, all of them are probably circles with the kind of arc sweep set to different values, and then the um, strokes set to different colors and width thicknesses. Um, but by combining all of these different shapes in the way that he um, has, you have this sense of like kind of going through a wormhole or going through like a laser tunnel or something of that kind. If you look at this one underneath it, um, I think it creates a really great impression of a sunset very easily by using this gradients um, layout here in the background. And then adding all these like basically triangle shapes that be, um, become the mountains with all these gradients that give the sense of like light coming from afar and the, the foreground being a little bit darker. So these are like relatively quote unquote more simple illustrations, but I think they accomplish what you might think of as like vector art um, when you think of like shapes and color and you know basic properties that create something that's very beautiful. This next one, um, these are also like 
I guess, kind of quote unquote, more simple illustrations that you might think of with vector art. I keep saying this because we're going to get into some like crazy stuff later on. Um, but I think that these accomplish what they're doing very, very well. These are illustrations of very, very iconic video game consoles and controllers um, that I think um, really successfully like capture the feeling both of like the nostalgia and the retro feeling playing on these um, systems. And then also the actual shape and the structure of all of these um, objects really easily. Plus, I think it is helpful that you can kind of see how they might have built this. So on this one, for example, this whole shape is probably not like a complex vector. It's just one rectangle that has an extra bevel on one side. So the border radius in one corner is greater than the other three, giving it that feeling. Um, and then other than that, it looks like rectangles here, um, rectangles with like beveled edges here, um, circles here. It's all basic shapes, but it communicates the sense of the Game Boy very successfully. Getting a little bit more complex, these add a little bit more color and a little bit more gradients and shadows and things like that. I really, really enjoy these. I think also the fact that it's this niche topic of mini calculators is very cute. I would highly recommend you dive into these files because you can actually just open up the file itself and see how did they build this. I think with a lot of these, I was really curious um, how they made everything feel a little bit three dimensional without getting you know, into the details of that way too much. Um, but the way that they did say, for example, um, the shine on this like Olivetti calculator um, using a gradient gives it the feeling of being metallic. And not only that, it feels like it's rounded at the top, which I think is really difficult to um, capture that they've done this really successfully. And again, all of these illustrations are done entirely in Figma without the help of any other software. Uh, I really like this one as well. I think this one uh, captures negative space in a really interesting way. So thinking about negative space as things that like don't have any assets on them or don't have any uh, art on them. Um, the negative space is used really interestingly because the um, building is the same color as the background. So they've had it fade kind of into the background here, creating um, a really interesting shape over the entire piece. And then they've successfully captured the lighting of this really, really well. Um, because you see this kind of gradient shadow right here and you see that the trees kind of darken at the edges here, you can tell that the light source is probably somewhere up here, um, which is like cohesive with the entire piece as this whole background circle fades out in this 45 degree angle direction as well. Um, overall, I think this piece like captures a lot of like Figma's capabilities as an illustration software. Um, but we'll go into something else that's a little bit more intense. Uh, as we kind of progress through these, you see that these illustrations are like progressively more three dimensional. I think that is a really difficult thing to capture with vector art, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, but that these uh, illustrations in particular capture it very successfully. This is one that I think like people like went crazy for on Twitter. People love this one. This artist has a ton of these uh, kind of Disney illustrations that. Um, the actual like illustrators at Disney definitely would not be doing them in this manner. They would be more likely digital painting them um, in some kind of other software. But by doing them in a vector format, you are able to get really closely in there and see all of the different shapes they've used to capture. Let's say this chunk of his face is one color. It's kind of this light with fuzziness around it. This chunk might be one color. Um, these like purple hazes might be their own kind of shapes. And so the idea of using shapes to build out illustrations can get really, really complex and really, really layered. Um, if you ever played Monument Valley, someone ever heard of that? It was like an app from a while ago. Okay, our staff knows what Monument Valley is. Um, but this game uh, came out quite a bit ago and somebody made this kind of level design kit that uses components in a really, really creative way. Um, and I think it also uses auto layout to make all the blocks snap into place to make these really nice columns. So you can use this um, file to actually build your own Monument Valley levels. Um, and then finally, I think this is probably one of the most impressive illustrations in Figma consistently. This like surprises people, but it was built entirely in Figma. And on top of that, this file has really detailed instructions on like how they went through this whole process. So you can see the way that they looked at the reference image and the way that they sectioned off different areas in order to uh, create this really, really intricate piece that is made entirely in Figma, completely with vectors. So. That was just a little bit of like a flex of what Figma is able to do. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how you can start approaching illustration on your own if you are interested. So when I say illustration, what is that? What do I actually mean? Illustrations are essentially visual imagery that expresses or communicates something. So in the sense of the verb to illustrate, that's what illustrations are intended to do. A lot of them have a pretty specific purpose, like for example, illustrations in a children's book or illustrations, any kind of book itself, it's meant to help you visualize the words and essentially communicate something additional to you that you can't normally see through just the text. 
um, in uh, other kind of examples or other kind of scenarios, like for example, um, medical illustrations, there's again a very clear goal or end process and something that needs to be communicated. Um, but on the other hand, when you think about um, something that's more creative, quote unquote, um, this is like a JC Leyendecker illustration painting that I really, really love. Um, the thing that you might be trying to communicate may, might not be something that is particularly specific or might not be something that is particularly like scientific, but it's something that you personally want to share. Um, so an illustration is a very varied term. It can be a visual that tells a story. It can communicate a piece of information. It can tell, it can share something about yourself personally, but anything um, that you think of as an illustration, the end goal is generally to communicate. So think about that, think about storytelling as we kind of go through this whole process today. It's also not limited to any particular medium. I think when people hear the word illustration, they tend to think um, a lot of color. They tend to think um, traditional art. They might not necessarily go immediately to let's say graphic design or let's say vector art, um, but that is also encompassed between illustration as well. So as a refresher of vector illustrations, vectors are lines created by math as opposed to rasters or opposed to um, placing pixels on a screen. Um, and the idea is that the curves are maintained through computation. Vector illustration is a type of digital or, or software assisted illustration rather than thinking of it as a, an art style, think of it more as a media. So in the same way that all oil paintings can look very different from each other and all acrylic paintings can look very different or all color pencil drawings can look very different, all vector art can be looked very different as well. I think people tend to go towards like the corporate art style, DoorDash, like that kind of stuff and think of that as the only way to do vector illustration. But the reality is that there's a lot that you can do with it. Um, these are some examples of different things that I found online and from our staff um, that were all created in some way, shape, or form through vectors or could be conceivably made as vectors if they were um, painted. Um, so think of it again, these are not one cohesive art style beyond the way that they all use shapes in some way, in the same way that like all oil paintings use oil paint. The principles that we're going to talk about today as an introduction to illustration are perspective, color, and composition. There are a lot of other principles. If you ever go to art school, you will probably be laughed at for referencing this presentation, um, but things like light, silhouette, scale, texture. We can't cover everything today, but I think these are the three most important things that we want you to focus on as you're thinking about vector illustration within Figma. So we'll start with perspective. Perspective is how you understand three-dimensional objects in two-dimensional space. There's a, different, a lot of different ways to kind of achieve three-dimensionality depending on the effect that you want, whether it's realistic, if you want to make it really exaggerated or fantasy looking or disorienting or anything else. Um, but sometimes, and especially in vector work, you might not want your illustration to appear three-dimensional at all, which is where we get that kind of flat art style that I mentioned before. Um, but yeah, that's why it's kind of um, the lack thereof as well. So the idea here is that if you're looking at a screen, um, unless you're living in the future, your screen is probably two-dimensional, it's probably flat. And if you want to convey the feeling of something being three-dimensional, you have to use um, some kind of sense of perspective. So one common thing they'll teach you in art school or like in an art class is one point perspective, which means that everything converges at a vanishing point right here. Um, so in this example, you can see that all the lines kind of move towards that vanishing point, no matter where they are on the screen. Um, so in this way, you create a sense of depth through linear perspective by having a clear structure that directs your eye. So even if I had these white dotted lines removed, your eyes would naturally feel like all of the lines on this cube essentially converge at a single point, which is the vanishing point. Um, you create basically a clear mental structure for what far away means and what close means, even in a 2D image, where things that are far away kind of tend to disappear into the horizon the way that things naturally would if you look far away. That's why we can't see the edge of the earth. Um, and then things that are closer to you are larger, the same way that like, you know, this chair physically in my, in my field of vision right now is this big, while those chairs in the back are this big. Obviously, those chairs are actually the same size. I know you guys can see them on Zoom, um, but this difference is like an optical illusion, essentially. Um, you can also have the horizontal line sit, um, or the vanishing point sit on a horizontal line known as the horizon line. And broadly speaking, the closer something is to the horizon line, the further away it is. So if I'm looking into this classroom, again, sorry, you can do this practice on, on your own rooms. But if I'm looking at this classroom, the very back of the room is probably the closest thing I can have to a horizon line right now. And those chairs that are in the back of the room uh, look smaller to me right now than the chairs that are in the front of the room because these are closer to me right now. 
Um, this is the same sense of like, why does the moon look so small when it's actually huge? It's very, very far away. Things that are far away become smaller. You can also work with two point perspective where you add an additional vanishing point on the same horizontal line. If you ever take an architecture class, they will teach you all about this, um, but that's probably a little bit extraneous for what we wanna teach for today. It's a little bit out of scope for the course. So here are some quick examples of one point perspective in famous works of art. Um, and this one, or actually we'll start with this one um, on the lower left corner. The vanishing point is very, very obvious in this case. Everything really converges on this particular moment. Um, you can kind of sense the horizon line that goes in a straight line, basically right through the middle. And the artist conveys it really clearly with the road going directly into that point and also the lines of trees going into that point. Beyond just the lines on the bottom, you can see it on the top when the tops of the trees um, all converge here as well. And then in the back with the field right here. Um, and this painting is well, extremely famous. Um, not only is a vanishing point in the center, it's like on the most important fi figures in the entire piece. So they become the focal point because your eye, no matter where you look, is going to be drawn towards the middle two figures. I really should know who they are. They are famous philosophers. I always forget their names. They're the most famous ones, but they're in the middle because they're the most important part of this piece and also the most important part of that culture at the time. If you look here as well on the bottom left, or on the bottom right, on the bottom right, <laughs> you can see that all of the um, points don't necessarily converge in the direct center like the other two, but rather a little bit offset here. And again, this couple is at the focal point, it's at that vanishing point. And so our eyes are drawn to them most clearly. Um, in addition to all of the actual lines going there, this dog is heading in that direction as well. So there's a sense of movement going towards uh, the vanishing point. In this one, you can't actually see the vanishing point at all. It's clearly behind the wall that is here, but all of the lines do go into um, a particular point. So especially with the lines of the bed, the lines of the room right here, the lines of the chair, you can assume the vanishing point is probably somewhere up here or in uh, here in the background. Um, and even though it's cut off the same way that this room is cut off with a wall right now, I know that things are far away because for example, the, the front end of the bed is smaller than the back end of the bed that's closer to me. Next um, form of perspective we want to talk about is something that if you've ever like taken like an illustrator class, you've probably had to do this before, but is uh, iso isometric views. So isometric view is something that has no foreshortening, which is what we were talking about with small things far away, big things up close. Without foreshortening, isometric um, perspective still conveys a sense of three-dimensionality using something called parallel projection. Everything that you see that is isometric is following this very, very specific grid that's set at very, very specific angles um, of these parallel lines that cut across the entire thing. So as opposed to these pieces where there are essentially no parallel lines at all, everything converges. Isometry has everything on parallel lines that gives you the sense of like predictability in the spatial structure of the image. So the core of isometric um, art is essentially two sets of parallel lines that run across the entire piece, forming these natural diamonds that are preserved throughout the entire piece. That's why you see a lot of like isometric stuff with cubes, like that one optical illusion of lots of cubes, um, has a lot of diamond shapes throughout it. So this essentially lets you make something appear three-dimensional, uh, although it's technically distorted because actual like objects that you place that way will not look in that sense. Um, but it feels three-dimensional without maintain, uh, while still maintaining the construction of the object. And for that reason, a lot of video games choose to use isometry because you need to know how large everything is. Your sense of scale in a video game, like I have Hades here as an example, it would be confusing if there was foreshortening uh, because you wanna see kind of a bird's eye view. And in these cases, you kind of act more like an observer in the scene or as something that is like an omniscient presence because it's not realistic. Whereas in these pieces, I could I can like conceivably feel that I am at that place. I am in that scene. In these cases, I'm clearly not actually here. I'm looking at it probably from above as if it's like some detached presence. Um, Roller Coaster Tycoon, any other Sims game, anything that um, has you placing stuff needs to be isometric or needs to be consistent. Um, if you're playing the Sims and everything kind of like distorted the further away you got, it would be very difficult to visualize, say, the whole neighborhood that you're building. Roller Coaster Tycoon is the same way, where if I'm putting down a... Uh, people wave their arms around if you want the lights back on. Yay, okay. Whereas in like Roller Coaster Tycoon, if I place one roller coaster and I'm going to the other side of the park to place another one, I want to know how big they are consistently without having to zoom back and forth um, to assume how large they are. Again, other RPGs, it would make not that much sense if all these enemies were different sizes because it's important um, that I know kind of the scale of everything. 
well, atmospheric perspective is another um, thing that is similar to what we talked about with one point perspective, but a little bit more vibey, I guess. Atmospheric perspective is usually using the atmosphere that you create in illustration to create depth. So this means basically the vibes of it, um, reducing clarity, adjusting the color um, and the size of objects to generally mimic things without being quite as strict as one point perspective might normally be. Um, so while this applies a lot more often in paintings, you can generally understand it as another way of communicating distance without strict rules. So in this kind of quick example, um, the object that is closest to the viewer is the largest, it is the warmest and it is the sharpest, whereas the object that is the furthest away is literally blurrier um, because I have, you know, nearsightedness. Um, it is darker and it also is cooler in color. So a lot of the time you use cool and warm colors as a way to communicate distance um, on top of whatever else. So in these examples, uh, these are all paintings that use atmospheric perspective. As you can see, a lot of these are landscapes, but I think really interesting is like the Mona Lisa is actually also using atmospheric perspective. Um, the Mona Lisa herself, like she is in the foreground, the colors on her palette are much warmer and they're much more distinct and sharp. Her features are very clearly communicated, whereas the background is a bit washed out. It's a little bit blurrier. It's not quite as clear. And it uses cooler colors like these blues and greens um, to indicate the distance. And you can tell in this image that everything here is pretty far away because the sense of scale is very um, different, where these entire mountains are reduced the size of basically her nose. Um, all of these other paintings as well, you can see how uh, they use different color choices and then this um, ultimately kind of does use one point perspective and it does have a horizon line uh, but it's assisted by the fact that like these objects in the foreground are quite clear whereas the sun in the background is quite blurry now finally what i talked about before 2d slash flat art a lot of the time vector art and graphic design don't really stick to any of these rules because there isn't a need to appear three-dimensional um, if you think about say a logo a lot of the time logos are not necessarily going to be super super detailed or they don't need to have a sense of like feeling three-dimensional because you think of them almost like a sticker or almost like something that is flat flat design often refers to a specific visual style that uses simple shapes and bold colors that isn't strictly realistic um, for the conversation about this i don't want to go into the whole detail of like is corporate art shitty or not um, i just want to focus on the idea that not all art needs to have depth and so if you're going towards an illustration think about what you actually need to communicate and what you need to convey um, whether you aren't whether or not you need to use three dimensionality. So these aren't exhaustive. Experiment with what you need to convey and don't be afraid to trust your own judgment. Ultimately, all of these lessons about perspective are about tricking the eye. So if something looks like it makes sense to you, that is generally a good sign to keep going in that direction. Um, you shouldn't feel like you have to start every single illustration like, which kind of perspective am I going to use unless you purposely want to practice those things. It's more important, again, with illustration is the story that you're trying to tell and what you're trying to communicate. So if you want something realistic, try one point. If you want something that's very abstract, you can do something isometric. If you need something that's flat, keep it in 2D. Um, but remember that visual believability is generally more important than being pixel perfect. You just want to convince the people looking at your art that what you've done is correct or what you've done is what you have in your mind. Cool. Any questions about perspective before we move into color? Awesome. So color is core to how we see and feel illustrations and also just the world around us. Different palettes create different atmospheres and emotions and understanding when and how to use different colors is really important in how you communicate what you want in a given piece of art. So colors in design, we kind of talked about this in week two, are used to attract your attention, get you to feel something, get you to think something, organize elements or add strong aesthetic for usability. Um, and then color is different on any kind of aspect of application um, and everything that we interact with. Basically the entire world is in color. And so we have a lot of preconceived notions about what different colors necessarily mean. Um, so color wheels, which you might've learned at some point in like say elementary school, art school, um, is basically a way to visualize the entire gamut of color. So primary colors, starting with kind of red, yellow, and blue, these are colors that you cannot make from others. Secondary is combinations of primary, so orange, green, and purple. And then tertiary is literally anything that is in between. So any kind of mix between primary and secondary colors, any kind of purple that leans a bit more red, any kind of blue that uh, green that leans a little bit more blue. Um, anything like that is a tertiary color, meaning that most of the colors we see in the real world lean a little bit more like tertiary. 
Um, these are some of the concepts that we discussed in an earlier lecture, week two. I'm kind of reviewing this as just something that you can go back to and think about. Um, but everything that we talked about in the context of graphic design or in UI design applies as well in illustrations. These colors still have these preconceived notions behind them. And when you're creating an illustration, if it's for a particular purpose, you have to work within your demographic schema and what they already know. So going into kind of the weeds about how a color is made, there's three basic properties that we can use to describe any color. There's a lot of different ways to describe color, but this is the one that um, is most frequently used in art. Um, hue, saturation, and value. Hue is where on the color wheel a particular color sits. What would you say that it is? That's the hue. If you say this is green, the hue is green. If you say this is purple, the hue is purple. The saturation, on the other hand, is how intensely pigmented a color is from being extremely bright neon. So you can think of this side of the scale as as red as possible, whereas the other side of it is very close to white, very close to gray. Something that doesn't have a lot of saturation in it is generally less bright. And finally, how um, light or dark a color is, basically from black to white, is the value. I honestly have a hard time um, sometimes basically differentiating between what these two might necessarily mean, but playing around on an actual like color picker will be helpful in visualizing what something that is like high saturation, high value, high saturation, low value is versus low saturation, et cetera, et cetera. So hue, again, where something sits on the Figma color picker that you can access by clicking on any of these squares um, when you have a color selected. Hue is this bottom bar that goes through the entire rainbow. Saturation, on the other hand, um, the uh, vibrancy basically is the top, is like the x-axis. So moving from the left side is the lowest saturation, while the right side is the highest saturation. Um, you can basically move horizontally in the color picker. I think it's most obvious to tell when it's at the top um, to see basically how bright something is. And on the other hand, value is the vertical axis. So the top is higher value and the bottom is the lower value. This is a little bit easier to visualize when you think about um, the entire bottom of value zero is pure black, um, no matter how high the saturation is. Because if you turn the brightness all the way down, no matter what color it is, the color is gone. So you can think of that. Um, basically, the black is the entire bottom part, whereas white is the top left. And red is the, um, or the brightest saturation is the top right. Um, again, there's a lot of different ways to express color, and you're probably going to run into these if you do digital illustration in the future. Um, there's hue saturation value or hue saturation lightness that we just talked about. Oh, I think you're on low battery. Okay. Um, there's also um, RGB. If you're ever doing anything with web development or mobile development, you're probably going to run into RGB very quickly. Um, it tells you the quantity of red, green, and blue in any color. This is because the way that your screen is set up, it uses red, green, and blue pixels and red, green, and blue lights. Um, in order to communicate all of those colors. If you think about this, there is a less, there's a smaller like variety of colors you can communicate on a screen than you can actually see with your eyes. So all of the colors in the physical world are not gonna be able to be represented. And a really key kind of example of that is like bright, bright blue. A lot of really bright blues do not render properly on screens the way that you would be able to see them in real life. Um, so keep that in mind as you kind of go into your work. Um, there's also hex values, um, which are just RGB values, but in hexadecimal, um, which is just a like, numerical system. And then CMYK. CMYK is what you use if you're using a printer. It's cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Um, it's not actually available as a colorway in Figma, um, but if you ever need to print something from Figma, it's important to consider that CMYK has an even smaller range of values because they don't make ink for every possible color in the world. Um, so if you want to print something and you have things like those really bright blues or really bright magenta, Keep in mind that they might not print that way because of the limitations of combining cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Um, so creating a color palette, if you are kind of approaching an illustration or you're thinking about what you want to create, um, it's helpful, I think, sometimes to start with a set of colors. So now that we understand what they're made of and how they're organized and why we use them, how do we go about creating cohesive combinations? And in short, what do we do to make colors actually look good together? So temperature is one thing. So the warmer and the col cooler colors can be used in a way that um, is leveraged to be more useful to you. So think about how your body is affected by the temperatures warm and cool. Your brain is gonna react to the colors similarly. So warm colors feel inviting. They feel warm, obviously. Um, whereas cool colors can feel refreshing or light or something that is like renewing. And having an intentional variety or unity in temperature can help you tell a story to make a palette with these colors. Um, and any color, particularly black or white, can lean to be more warm or more cool. 
Um, so thinking about like, this is an example where we have two blacks on the screen. I don't know how well it's coming across. Um, this black is much warmer and it feels basically like a dark brown, whereas this black is much cooler and is actually just a dark navy. On the other side, we have two colors that outside of context would feel like they are white, um, but this one is a little bit more of a beige, whereas this is closer to like a robin's egg blue. Um, and so having them lean in that particular direction is really helpful for creating like neutral tones that still match your whole palette. Um, I think it's rarer to see actually using pure white or pure black in illustration because they're very jarring colors. Um, and pure white and pure black don't really appear in nature very often, um, unless it's in very extreme situations. Color schemes as well, this is something that's gonna be really helpful. Um, complementary analogous triadic split complementary. Complementary is any two colors that are directly opposite on the color wheel, you know, red and green, blue and orange, yellow and purple are the main ones that you can think about. Um, but this maximizes contrast and like quote unquote stability. This can be a little bit dangerous if you go into like Christmas color territory, it'll be very bold depending on the way that you approach it. Um, but there are ways to modify you know, the exact hues and the exact shades of the colors to make it feel more cohesive. Analogous colors are any three or more colors that are right next to each other. So red, orange, yellow, orange, yellow, green, yellow, green, blue, anything that you would see right next to each other is considered analogous. This will feel very, very cohesive. It'll feel very unified. Um, but in this case, it can be dangerous if it feels like these colors are quite similar to each other, if it's difficult to um, differentiate objects from one another. So just be conscious of that. Triadic colors are three evenly spaced. Um, so the most common example of this would be red, yellow, and blue. This can be very, very vibrant, but it requires very careful balance. And I wouldn't recommend that you use all three colors in the same quantity. It can be helpful to use one more, one a little bit less, and one very little in order to kind of feel a little bit more balanced and cohesive at the end of the piece. Um, and then split complementary, which is I think pretty common where you take um, one color and then the ones opposite from it go to the ones next to them so that they aren't quite exactly the opposite, um, but there is very clear um, contrast between the colors as well with a little bit more variety. So instead of having red and just pure green, you can have red and like teal and red and yellow green in a way that feels a little bit more cohesive. Um, I keep seeing this right now where you're wearing a red jacket in the background and the chairs are kind of a yellow green, which feels um, very clearly contrasting. So like you stick out in a really good way. I don't want to like put you on the spot, um, but like it feels like a cohesive color palette um, because of the way those colors are related to each other, um, but they don't contrast way too much. So these are some other examples of using these color schemes. This complementary has orange and green. Um, this orange leans a little bit warmer and the blue I think also leans a bit warmer here in this example. Analogous has yellow green to green to teal. Triadic just straight up primary colors. Adding black and white in this can help you um, give a little bit more of a visual break on your eyes, lessen the cognitive load. And then split complementary, I think this feels very Halloween-y but I quite liked it. It's purple, orange, and a green, where in this case you'd have purple here and then orange and green as the um, two complements. So looking at these color palettes, a lot of these are visually pleasing because they keep one property of hue, saturation, or value relatively similar across the entire palette. So this, for example, um, these kind of pastel colors that have become really popular, these have pretty similar saturation. They are pretty light um, in the saturation. They're not super, super bright, but they vary in their lightness or their value in their hue. Any monochromatic palette like these two, the purple and the green ones in the bottom, they keep the hue the same, but they vary the saturation, the value. Um, so using this as kind of one property to help you um, approach creating your own color palettes, I think can be helpful in um, creating a sense of unity. Oh. Um, context is also important. If you've ever seen people who like do these optical illusions, you can see that your eyes will trick you. The context of a color and everything around it is gonna be informing um, the viewer about like what exactly it is that you're looking at. And so in this case, we have you know, two swatches that are actually the same purple, but they feel quite different. Um, this is important. Basically, even if the hex value of two colors is the same, if they feel like they're different and they're tricking the user's brain, that's important to uh, keep in mind. You can go back to anything like the dress of like red and whatever it was, black and blue and white and gold, that dress thing. Um, it didn't matter what the actual colors were because everybody was talking about what the colors looked like. Um, so keep this in mind as whole, also as a way to maximize accessibility um, and use higher or low perceived contrast to your advantage. Cool. There's another example going into more context. 
we're not going to talk too much about light, but thinking about how light affects color, if you're trying to make an illustration of a room that has very warm lighting, you're unlikely to use a lot of blues because blue would become green. If you're talking about a like, let's say the cover of or like one of the, this is like the Euphoria cover or like whatever the soundtrack cover. Um, I think it's Zendaya's face, um, but the colors, if you color drop them are clearly blue and purple. They're very warm, or they're very cool colors. Um, and they aren't necessarily skin tone colors, but because you know what she looks like and because you know she's in a particular kind of lighting, those colors make sense, even though they're not like strictly what you would actually say is her skin tone. Um, so know that light can play tricks on your eyes and the full context of an object is important to consider. Um, these are just color drops of like, all of these have the same, I think, yellow cube and white sphere, uh, but this is all the different colors of them. And you can tell in at least like this top row what color they're supposed to be, even though they're washed out in those colored lights. Cool. Okay, so what we have left to talk about is composition and then all of the things that Aaron will be discussing. I'll be kind of blasting through this, but we're going to take a quick break for like two or three minutes so we can take a little water. Um, so we'll be back at 6.58 and I'll pause the recording for a moment. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started again um, for the next couple of sections. We're going to talk about composition and then all of the kind of practical applications of how to actually do all this in Figma itself. Um, so composition refers to the way that elements in a piece are laid out. It's where the things are composed and where the image is put together. Um, so how they interact with each other, how they come together, how they create dialogue. Um, everything is communicated through kind of this, the way that the piece is um, visually laid out. So while there's basically an infinite number of visually good compositions, there are some general rules that you can use to your advantage to create composition that works for you. If you've ever taken a class on any kind of art, any kind of um, say photography, you're going to have learned things that are similar to this as well. So we'll start with the classic rule of thirds. So of the strategies that we talk about today, rule of thirds is probably the most well known one. So in short, you can basically split a canvas into nine equal parts using um, thirds that go um, horizontally and vertically. Um, the eye is naturally drawn to the resulting intersection of those thirds and the illustrations can thus place important elements on those key intersecting points. Um, this is a common enough rule that like the default iPhone camera can show you these lines for the rule of thirds. Um, Instagram does the same where if you zoom in on an object or zoom in on like a photo, it shows you these kind of third dividing lines um, because this is just so common in like a way that is creating an image that's pleasing to the eye. So I'll co show basically a couple of examples for each of these rules. The first is this piece um, by Salvador Dali where if you see this, it's not quite exactly on those third lines, um, which could be affected by the way the image is cropped or by the way that the image is framed. Um, but essentially you see that the, the, the shoreline is essentially at that top third. And this clock is most close to this intersection, whereas this whole, um, you know, whatever it is that Dolly is painting is closest to this intersection as well. So this in this way, our eye is basically drawn I think first to go here and then like to go around the shoreline to come down here and then see everything that is on this table where like this, although it's very bright, I kind of noticed it last because it is kind of out of the way of these third lines that are in the image. Next, this is a screenshot from uh, Eternal, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Um, so in this shot, they are aligned with kind of their torsos and their hearts closest to this intersection point. Um, and they're kind of aligned on this third line. And then this crack in the ice, while it is not quite on the corner, is aligned on the third line as well. Because it's not quite aligned on that exact point, my eye goes here first and then moves towards this crack because this is the most visually interesting part to me now. And this is the second most visually interesting. This is a shot from La La Land where she's looking, um, Emma Stone's character is both in the bathroom and then also her reflection is in the bathroom. And while herself, her actual physical self, is kind of pushed away from this line. Her face here is directly on that intersecting point, which means that you see her reflection first. In the context of the shot, I think they pan kind of around her. Um, so you see this one particular moment that like is an important screen grab here um, because she's aligned so perfectly with this third line and becomes the most interesting part of the image where you see her reflection before you actually see her. The next um, kind of set of composition rules is visual triangles. So continuing into the theme of threes, um, good things come in threes, et cetera, et cetera, using triangles and diagonals can help create leading lines and shapes. The triangle is also considered the quote unquote strongest object because it has its strongest base that goes into a point. So you know that it's not going to fall over, it's very stable. So through either implicit or actual painted triangles you can create a sense of direction and depth 
So even if these aren't aiding perspective, triangles are a strong basis for composition. They're clear enough to be identified implicitly um, and without having to actually have these hard lines, but they're interesting enough to direct the eye across the piece. And this piece in particular is really neat because if you look at the uh, when you look at it, you're probably gonna notice the top person first, and then you can follow the line of his eyes and his body to go down here where her body goes down to the bottom, but also because she looks kind of back up at him, there's like this circularity there. There's a little bit of a cycle that lets you um, go through the entire triangle very naturally. Other examples, the Mona Lisa again, people really like the Mona Lisa. It's very famous for a reason. She's essentially seated in a triangle because of the way that her uh, shoulders are tilted and her arms are tilted. So if you normally were to be looking forward, I wouldn't say that like this position that I am in right now is necessarily a triangle, but if I move my shoulders, um, to create a little bit less, um, to be a little bit more narrow here. Sorry, I really can't really see. I move my shoulders here and then have my arms down here. I'm creating a more natural triangle with my body um, that leads you to look at the top of it, which is my face, the width the Mona Lisa is here in this image. Um, this one also is kind of crazy. This one like goes really hard, these fighting dogs. Um, there's a couple of different triangles that are created in this image and they all lead to a sense of stability despite how much movement is happening. So even though this is a very chaotic piece in itself, um, it feels very stable to look at because of the composition of it. So you see this main triangle of the fighting dogs here. Um, but in addition to that, um, the background is also formed in triangles where you have the sky forming one triangle, um, this house forming a second one, and then the rest of the image here, very cleanly cutting into the darkness. So again, this splits up the piece very, very nicely into a clear rhythm um, that makes it very like easy to look at despite the violence happening in the image. I also, when I made this, I was like, I had to put a parasite screenshot in here. And I like this one a lot because it's more implicit. This isn't really like you look at it and you're like triangle, immediately triangle. Um, but it's implied because you can know that her arm, the elbow is creating the rest of the triangle in that image. Um, so you can go from her head to the peach following the line of her arm to get to that triangle, um, which really brings you into that kind of right angle point of this peach, the most important part of the image. A few more. Harry Potter has a lot of triangle motifs. I'm gonna talk at length about Harry Potter, but they're good illustrations. So in this particular one, you can see that the line of the um, shoulders and the line of the wand creates those two points of the triangle. And even though this line isn't very explicitly communicated, um, it's a little bit hard to tell here, but his cloak right here and her um, kind of head wrapping um, communicates the rest of that line very clearly. Um, so it's implied, even though this part of the triangle might not necessarily be there. The same goes for this one where it's a little bit more clear. You have the wing of the Phoenix and the body of the Phoenix. Um, and instead of it being um, Harry himself kind of finishing the triangle, this pillar implies the rest of that line. So you have these very strong compositions and especially for something like a book cover where people are judging it very clearly and looking at how um, the book illustration communicates the story very well. It's important to have like kind of clear and logical composition. So next is movement. So while you're creating a lot of images rather than necessarily GIFs or necessarily animations, you can create a sense of movement by having these implied lines of action. So key elements of a piece can be positioned to create movement. You can interpret it as literally, like if you take a photo of somebody that is running and there is motion blur and they're clearly in like this stance, you know they are moving. But you can also do it figuratively, like through strokes or through gestalt principles. So Starry Night was a very clear candidate for this because of the art style and the way that he applied um, this brushwork. All of these like tiny lines communicate a sense of movement because they flow into each other. If you see like an electron field or something, it feels like that as well. Um, so not only do you have like the swirling wind here, you also have this cloud that goes down into the countryside and then comes back up through kind of the, whatever it is that is in the image, the kind of black figure there. Um, the Great Wave is another really key example where you know this is a still shot of something that is constantly moving. We know that the ocean is always moving. The sea is not frozen in this position. Um, but on top of that, um, we know that kind of there's this very nice spiral that kind of swoops down and goes up. And then we can follow this and imply that it's going to come crashing back down, creating a sense of circularity in the image. Back to this image that we showed earlier. What I talked about earlier with the dog moving forward, that's gonna create that communicate that um, movement that goes towards the back of the image. But in addition to that, what I didn't mention earlier is that you can tell that this couple is walking back towards us, which creates again, circularity. So there's this clear stream of consciousness from um, the beginning of the painting right here that goes into the back and then comes back out to the front um, that kind of re, um, moves you back over forth um, through the image, kind of circle your eye. This is a little bit more literal, a painting of somebody dancing. 
because of the stance that she's in and because you can't stay in this position without falling over, you know, that she is in movement. Because I can't actually you know, lean my body that far without falling. Um, so I know in this case that the way that her arms are positioned, the way her body is positioned, even the way that her shadow uh, feels like it's almost in motion, this painting in particular very beautifully captures a moment of movement without actually being animated or without actually using these kind of elements of stroke or perspective. Negative space, we mentioned this a little bit before with that Sea Ranch photo. Um, and we've discussed negative space as well as a gestalt principle, but talking about it in illustration um, creates a lot of really interesting conversation. This is a very, very beautiful movie poster for a portrait of a lady on fire where it looks like a flame. But if you look at the negative space, um, you see like a nose and two, uh, basically two faces that are close to kissing. So you see the nose here, the lips here, the chin here, um, and the lips here as well on the chin. A lot of optical illusions rely on negative space, creating this feeling of like two images in one. Um, but you can take it a little bit less literally as well to create um, you know, a great impression when there is a lack of element on a canvas, uh, whatever the background color might be. But be intentional about the way that you use negative space. Don't be afraid to use it. Don't feel like you have to cover every inch of something. Um, giving room to breathe can create a lot of very visual interest. Please load. All right, so this piece, um, an example, I already saw it here. Um, this actually uses triangles as negative space, again, to create that um, sense of strong composition and sense of stability. So in here, there's quite a few triangles going on that I didn't even highlight. There's the entire triangle of like the whole grand piano where we know that the piano is in the foreground and he's behind it almost as part of the background. Um, but the actual explicit negative space is created right here um, in these, uh, in these um, triangles that are very clearly communicate like shape and structure, especially for this piece where he looks quite somber. This shot from Spider-Verse is kind of like the like chills moment, like the feeling of like breath, uh, breathlessness or weightlessness. Um, and it uses negative space in a very, very intentional manner because you have the entire city, the whole busy city of New York um, kind of suspended in, and then you have miles suspended in midair here. And so this whole use of like expansive negative space makes him feel very, very small, but very, very powerful in that moment because he's breaking through the space um, as opposed to being part of the, um, the rest of the city. Any questions about any of those composition techniques? Cool. Um, if you ever want to kind of think about composition, a really good way to do so is to look up movie screenshots, um, film stills. Um, I think Movie Grab is the name of one of the sites that you can use to um, look at like the way that those compositions are laid out, even though it is a screenshot of something, or even though it's one still moment in a moving picture people take those screen grabs as being iconic for a reason. And a lot of that goes to the composition of a piece um, in the way that it almost feels like a photo or a painting or an illustration. But yeah, with that, we're gonna move to Aaron's conversations for today, um, talking about the pen tool. Oh. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, now that we've kind of talked about how to create illustrations and what types of illustrations are out there, um, we're going to go into more of like the technical details on how to create them. Because like once you kind of know what you want to execute in your head, um, it's important to have a lot of tools in your toolbox when you're going forward. And there are a lot of tools in Figma, just like an illustrator. Okay, so just quick recap. Um, this is the pen tool. You can access it by pressing P or the fountain pen icon on the top left toolbar. And once you click on that pen tool, you're going to be taken into vector edit mode. So once you're in vector edit mode, you'll notice that your interface on the top left changes a little bit and you'll get some new tools um, that you can change these vectors with. So you'll notice the pen tool, the bends tool, the select tool and the paint bucket tool. And it's important to remember that once you press done, everything is going to be in one vector network. So if you want to create multiple vector networks, you have to actually create the vector, exit out of vector edit mode, and then create a new vector. Okay, um, these are Bezier curves or Bezier curves. Um, all curves in Figma are represented with these Bezier curves. And it's basically just a node and two handles, and the direction and angle of these handles is going to control the direction and angle of your curve. So once you create a curve, you can kind of play around with these angles. Okay, and this is a vector panel. So once you enter into the vector edit mode interface, 
The vector panel is going to be on your right in the design section where you usually like your fill and your color is. And I actually personally don't mess around with these settings too much, but it's important to note that if you set the setting to mirror angle and length, that's going to adjust the handles and make sure that the curve is very smooth because both the angle and length of the handles is going to be mirrored. Um, and yeah, again, all these, all these settings affect the handles of the curves. Okay, and this is the paint bucket and fill tool. So on vector edit mode, the upper left hand of the screen is going to have this half filled in diamond. And this is what you can use to fill in vectors and fill in like specific parts of the vectors. So as you can see in this single vector network, um, we've added a fill to three of these shapes. And with the paint bucket tool, you can alter, you can kind of turn on and off the fill. Um, and it used to be that all that the vector could only be one color, but Figma updated recently. And now you can color one vector network in all one color. So in this GIF, you can see that this is all one vector network. And you can actually go in with the select tool and select different sections that will be like highlighted with these blue stripes and use the eyedropper tool, which you can access by pressing I. That's a really useful shortcut that I use all the time. And eye dropping from different colors to color in the same vector network. Yeah. Okay. And now some tips for custom vectors. Um, like when creating vectors, a lot of it is trial and error. So you kind of develop like your own shortcuts and your own ways of working through vectors. But there are, here are like a few tips that I personally use um, that like really streamlined my workflow when I was learning vector art. Okay, the first one is healing nodes. So I know when I first started drawing things like the Facebook Messenger sticker, I would just place a bunch of nodes anywhere I thought there was a curve and then like use the bend tool to just bend everything. But if you do that all the time, sometimes your illustration is going to look very shaky, very wobbly around the edges. So I found out that you can actually delete one specific node without erasing the entire line by clicking on that node, holding down shift and then pressing backspace. So if you just click on the node and press backspace, it's going to delete that node and take away the entire line that's connected to that node. But if you press and hold shift, it should take away just that node. If you place like a node in the middle of this line on the rectangle, as you see. And another tip for healing nodes is that this mainly works best with straight lines and sometimes with curves, because if you take away the node on the curve, it's going to change like the shape of the whole curve. I kind of think like the node is like a pin kind of pulling the curve in one way. And if you take that out, it like snaps kind of like a rubber band. So fortunately you have command Z if you heal a node away and you realize you don't actually want it. Okay, and another way of making curves is the bend tool. So a helpful shortcut is once you draw a straight line, you can press and hold control or command and just drag that line down. So here we're dragging down from just the middle of the line and that's gonna create like a really symmetrical and smooth curve for the bottom of the boat. But you can also like kind of drag off to the side um, and this is really useful if you place if you place like a few nodes and you want to kind of create the shape by dragging out the curves, like maybe the curve of a face, um, like a moon shape, because it creates like a smooth curve rather than you having to like adjust the handles yourself. Okay, and again with healing notes, nodes like wobbly lines are a really common issue. So as you notice, this popsicle looks like it's melting. And that's probably because there are too many nodes on the curve. And so something to keep in mind is that you want to try to place nodes where the curve changes. And that's a little easier to see with an example. So the popsicle on the left has 53 nodes and the popsicle on the right has 34, which is significantly less. And the one on the left, you can see like alongside the face where it's kind of one consistent curve, like making that curve of the face, but there's several nodes, maybe like three or four. And once you heal away one of those nodes, the face is going to be like a lot smoother, almost like it was just drawn as a circle or oval rather than this wobbly curve. 
And again, you can heal those nodes by just clicking on them, holding shift and backspace once you're in vector edit mode. Okay, fill and effects. So this is how you essentially color in illustrations and create that sense of depth we were talking about earlier. And like, you may know what a lot of these gradients are, but it's useful just to kind of see them so you can get a sense for how you might use them in your illustrations. So this is a linear gradient. Um, the default linear gradient is going to transition you between fully filled in opacity to clear. And it kind of creates this like hazy, almost shadow effect if you start from black. And, but you can apply this to both fills and strokes, which is important to note. And you can also add multiple colors to the same gradient, which I recently figured out. So if you remember that sunset illustration from one of the first slides in the lecture, it starts like where the mountains are. It goes like yellow, red, and then purple. And that's three colors in one gradient. So you can add um, multiple colors to the gradient by clicking on this gradient bar itself. And when you do so, another one of these squares with color in it should pop up. And from there, you can adjust like the position of those squares on the gradient and create as many colors as you want. So I find that I find that really useful when you're trying to create like a 3D effect or like a shine of light. You can use a linear gradient with like multiple colors. Okay, and radial gradients. So instead of going from top to bottom, these gradients are going to start in the middle and go outwards. So I often use these if I'm trying to create like a light, like a fairy light maybe. I'll make this yellow and then so it's like a little like burst of light. And similar to linear gradients, you can add multiple colors to a radial gradient. So here you can see that this target effect was created by adding purple, red, purple, but in between them, there's a transparent layer. So that's responsible for like the gaps in the circle. Um, and it's also these gradients, you can adjust the shape of the circle. So you can make it like an ellipse gradient spreading out, but you can't adjust it beyond that. So you can't make like a bean shaped gradient with this. Okay, next is angular gradient. So this gradient starts at a specific point, which is this yellow, I mean, white dot with this red circle square around it. And it like, it radiates out like clockwise from that point. So you can see like the order of the colors in the bar is reflected in like the order they um, rotate around this circle. And something also to note for angular gradients is that this is a ring. So it's not showing the center of the angular gradient. Sometimes when you create one, there's like, I'll leave my arms to turn on the light. This is all, okay, there we go. But there's like a little point in the middle and like that's where the colors are like kind of coming to the middle, which looks a little weird. And also you'll notice that like red is the start and the end of the gradient here. If you make like the start and the end two really contrasting colors, there's going to be a straight line where they meet, which can look a little weird sometimes. So just be careful with that. And diamonds, uh, these are just kind of fun. You can make like sparkle shapes. Um, yeah, you can add multiple colors to them. You can adjust like how long it is. Um, yeah, it's pretty cute, I would say. Okay, and color styles. So it's important to note that when you make a gradient, you don't have to remake it every time you wanna use it because there's no eyedropper tool for the gradient. So once you make a rainbow gradient like this one and you really wanna save it, you can create a color style for it in the same way that you create color styles for the rest of the document. You just create it with this gradient. And that way you can apply it from the circle to the square to basically like any shape you want, which is really useful, um, especially if it's a really detailed gradient like this one. Okay, effects. I recently discovered this effects panel like right under the stroke on the far right. And it's actually, it's actually quite useful in illustration because like sometimes you don't wanna create a shadow with a gradient. So you can kind of use these effects as a shortcut. So effects, we have drop shadow, inner shadow, layer blur and background blur. So we'll go over them now. Okay, drop shadow. This one is like, you might've seen it in PowerPoint or like Microsoft Word. 
um, you basically just drop a shadow from the object behind the object. So it looks like the object is like protruding out here, like the I'm floating circle protrudes out of the page. Um, and some things you can adjust with these shadows is like the X and Y position of the shadow. So that's like how far to the left and to the up and down, like it's radiating out from the object and the blur and the color as well. So yeah. An inner shadow, this one is like a more indented look, maybe like an empty button or, a, or the inside of a box, but it creates it so that the object is like indented into the page, which is kind of cool. And you can adjust the same settings as in the drop shadow. Okay, layer blur. This one is going to make like whatever shape you've selected blur. So it's kind of like gouache and blur. If anyone's used like Procreate or Illustrator, it just like blurs outwards. And you can use this for text, you can use it on shapes um, and you can adjust like how blurry it is. But I found that this is actually really useful for shadows if you don't want to use gradients because you can like make the circle really blurry and then put it in a masking layer so that you can like cut off the blurriness in a specific area. So you can like draw the shape of your shadow and then make it blurry with layer blur, which is really cool. Okay, and background blur. This one, um, I personally don't use very often, but it blurs the layer that's underneath it. So it's kind of like adding like a piece of blurry glass onto your page. And as you can see, like the text on the left is clear and the text on the right is like a layer blur effect or a background blur effect. Okay, blend modes. Blend modes are a really useful way of kind of like changing the mood or the lighting of your piece. And it's, going, it's like a way of adding the color on top of the layer below it. Um, so first of all, like all your default shapes are going to start with pass through, which is basically like, if you think of putting a piece of like blank cardstock paper on top, it's going to be completely like not transparent. You're going to be able to like, it's just like a flat layer on top. But if you change this to, if you lower the opacity, then it's like a piece of like um, tissue paper or like a stained glass window. And so if you notice these two, um, these two layers are both at the same opacity, 40%, but this second one uses the overlay mode and it brings more life to the colors, but it also kind of gets rid of this like fuzzy feeling in the first one. So I use overlay if I want to apply like, I don't know, golden hour lighting because it'll apply it like directly to each color instead of giving this like fuzzy effect over the whole layer. Um, and the next one is multiply. So I think like these blend modes are actually the computer doing like mathematical calculations with the colors on the screen. So in this case, it's like, it's literally multiplying the hex codes of the, the color of the layer on top and the color of the layer on bottom. And when you like multiply something, it's it bigger. So in this case, the colors are getting a lot darker. Um, and color burn, um, this one is a little bit unconventional but it almost looks like you up to the contrast a lot. It makes the colors like really sharp, really vibrant. Um, so keep that in mind if you want like a really dramatic effect. Okay, oh, demo. Okay, now we're going to go over a few illustrations that we've done. So if you want to go back to the lecture slides, um, here are a few illustrations that Ace and I have done. Um, he did this watermelon. And if you notice, the, the color of the watermelon is actually one continuous linear gradient that he used to create that shine. And this cute little avatar has a lot of detail, probably a lot of masking layers, I'm guessing. Um, and this one I created also entirely in Figma. So I started by like drawing the cat first, just by like, just by using curves. And I wanted the shape to be pretty simple, but the hardest part was probably this pumpkin on top because it's supposed to be like a balloon. So I wanted it to be somewhat transparent, but it also has like the little indents where like the segments of the pumpkin are. So I originally tried to just apply um, 
like a circular blend mode on top, like a circular gradient on top of it, going from transparent to orange. But I found that that looked a little weird because a pumpkin isn't necessarily a circular shape. So I created a bunch of different um, ellipse gradients, like within each of the segments, and like adjusted them so that um, so that they would look like each segment had like a little bit of transparency. And I just used um, a pass through blend mode to make it a little bit transparent. Um, oh, and I also use layer blur on the eyes to create um, a little bit of shine. And that's why there's like a little bit of haziness around the oval. And yeah. Thank you to Erin for teaching for today. We're gonna to go ahead and wrap up uh, today's class um, with a couple of quick announcements. So the secret word for today will be the word gradient, G-R-A-D-I-E-N-T, gradient. Um, please make sure to submit the attendance form today. And please also, um, if you didn't hear earlier, uh, there's a question at the very end asking about having a class social next week. So in lieu of having our lecture, we're opting to have a social if enough students are interested. If you're not interested, we're not gonna have like a surprise lecture. We'll just not have a class next week. Um, so you can focus on working on your finals. Um, but yes, please do make sure to fill that out and please answer honestly. I would love to like get to see everybody um, together on the Glade or something. Um, here's a slide that got skipped. Oh, it didn't get skipped. Um, but I wanted to give a quick heads up. This week's homework in lab is a little bit different. So the homework this week is actually going to be part of the lab. So you're going to go to lab this Thursday and get introduced to this concept of interactive illustrations. And you're gonna to work together with your lab group to create an illustration system, uh, which then you'll have one additional week to work on the homework, which is to create three assets for that system, um, basically creating three variant illustrations. It's a little confusing, but your TA will be able to guide you through it. Um, and this is gonna be a homework due next Thursday. So you get a little bit of additional time. So we want you to focus on, again, submitting a proposal for the final um, and then getting to work on your final. Yeah. These are your only announcements for today. Um, thank you so much for coming and we'll see you hopefully next week. All right, thank you.